Okay. So in, in today's tutorial, we're going to do uh, three problems for, um, for practicing how to calculate transverse shear stress in beams. So we've got the first one uh, up here, and I'll just read the problem statement. So it says, uh, each of the main horizontal support beams of a bridge must be able to support the weight of a truck with a safety factor of 3.5. So our safety factor is 3.5. Each beam will be made of several eight inch by two inch Douglas fir boards. Okay, so we've got a bunch of these boards and I've got dot, 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 N boards because we don't know how many boards wide the beam is going to be. Okay, so this is uh, Douglas fir wood okay, for the boards. Um, each beam will be made of several two, eight inch by two inch Douglas fir, fir boards with the grain direction parallel to the length of each beam as we would expect. Okay, so part one says, Considering only bending, determine the required number of boards needed for each beam. Okay, so we want to find the required number of boards uh, n considering only bending. Okay, excellent. Uh, part two. For the number of boards calculated above, is the level of shear stress in the wood acceptably low? Okay. Um, is tau acceptably low? Okay, great. All right, so um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna design the beam, the cross section of the beam, uh, considering bending stress, and then we're gonna check that for that beam design, the shear stress is acceptably low. And we'll see this process repeated as we do more of these problems. In general, um, bending stress tends to be the, the, the requirement that you need to pay more attention to when designing beams. Um, so you usually design a beam considering bending stress and then check to make sure that the level of shear stress in the beam doesn't exceed um, what's allowable. So um, let's do the first part uh, to start with. So um, design the beam considering bending stress. So what we wanna do here is equate the ultimate strength of the wood divided by your safety factor, which gives us the allowable stress to the maximum bending stress within the beam. So with our equation, um, sigma equals my over i, we get the maximum bending stress when our internal moment is maximum, when our variable y is maximized, and then we have the moment of inertia down here. So for the beam in this case, and I'll just draw this as a rectangle leaving out the boards, we're going to be having internal bending moments that act about the horizontal centroidal axis. So this is the xx axis, so we want ixx in here. And then distance y, um, we know that uh, the maximum stress due to bending for a moment around that axis is going to be either up at the top of the cross section or down at the bottom of the cross section. One of these is going to be a tensile stress, the other one compressive, vice versa, depending on the orientation of the maximum uh, moment, which we'll get to in a minute. But the distance of these points from the axis of Bending in each case is the height of the cross section divided by two. So we know what y max is there. Um, now, because the distance uh, y max here is the same for um, the top or the bottom, we know that the magnitude of the largest tensile stress will be equal to the magnitude of the largest compressive stress. And 
what we'd want to use then on the left hand side of this equation is the ultimate strength that is lowest uh, realizing that wood has differing strengths in tension and compression. So for, for Douglas fir, that's the compressive strength that's lower. So we want to be looking at um, comparing the allowable compressive stress to the maximum compressive stress in the beam. So the first thing that we need to do here, I guess really the only thing left to do because we've kind of talked about all, all of the components of the equation already, is go ahead and find what the maximum internal moment is, and we'll do that by drawing our shear and moment diagrams. Um, so changing this into a free body diagram, just quickly, we'll erase that roller support and put in a support reaction uh, BY there and erase this pin support and put in a support reaction AY there. Um, you can do some of the moments about point A um, to find BY and then some of the forces in the Y direction. But the uh, quicker way to go here is realizing that the beam is symmetric about a vertical axis. So AY and BY need to be equal, which means they both need to be three. So we've got three uh, kips there and three kips there. So let's go ahead and draw our shear diagram. Um, and we'll set, up, we'll set up both our shear and moment diagrams and then draw the shear diagram and then the moment diagram. So the moment diagram we'll do in units of kip feet. Okay, there we go. And a couple of construction lines to help us relate length positions on the beam to positions on our shear and moment diagrams. Okay, there we go. All right, so shear diagram. Shear diagram always starts at zero and ends at zero. And what do we have? We have a jump up by AY first. So that's a jump up to three. And then no distributed load, zero distributed load, uh, zero slope on the shear diagram. So we continue horizontally. Uh, point load that's acting downwards, uh, so we jump down by three, and then again, no distributed load, zero distributed load, zero slope, jump down by three again, and continue over, this value here is minus three, and then we get to by, and that takes us up by three, and that's good because we needed to get back to zero, and we do. So I'll do a little bit of shading here, hatching. Okay, so for the moment diagram, all right, uh, let's look. No point moments along the beam, so the only thing we need to draw the moment diagram is the shear diagram. Start at zero, we've got constant positive values, so we need a constant positive slope, something like that. Uh, what do we get to? Well, the value of the moment at this location would be the area inside the corresponding portion of the shear diagram, which is three multiplied by four. Three by four gives us uh, 12 kip feet there. And then we've got values of zero here on the shear diagram, so the slope of the moment diagram needs to be zero, straight line. And then constant negative values, constant negative slope, and we know we have to get back to zero. Do we get back to zero? Well. Uh, change in 12, that 12 should be equal to the area here, minus 3 times 4, yeah. All right. So here, uh, we've got from this that our uh, maximum moment is what? Is positive 12 kip feet. So let's talk about the directionality of the moment relative to this picture of the cross section that I uh, drew here. So assuming that the beam's going back out this way, we've got a positive internal moment and a positive internal moment always means that the beam is being bent into a smiley face sort of geometry, which means that there's compression on the top of the beam and 
tension on the bottom of the beam. So the directionality of that internal maximum moment is like this, where the locations at the top are the maximum values of compressive stress. Okay, so it's the stress at these locations here that we want to compare to the ultimate compressive strength. So let's go ahead and do that and put everything in the, um, in the equation. So we're just going to bring this down here. So the ultimate compressive strength of Douglas fir from the material property table, making sure that we're looking in US units, is... 7.2 KSI, so we've got 7.2, and KSI, we want this in PSI, so times 10 to the 3, divided by our safety factor of 3.5, and I see that that's happened again. Okay, so we've got this, um, and then we're putting in our maximum moment over here. So that's 12 kip feet. So 12 times 10 to the three to change that from kip into pounds. And then we want the moment here in pound inches. Remember everything in units of pound inches PSI when we're working with uh, equations involving stress in US units. So multiply this by 12 to change the feet to inches. Then our variable y, again, this is the distance from the axis of bending, neutral axis of bending, to the points of interest. So that's half the height of the cross section. So we've got 8 divided by 2 there, and then divided by i. So 1 twelfth. The base is going to be 2 inches multiplied by the number of boards. So we've got 2n there, and the height is 8, and we'll cube that. Okay. So variable n comes out when we do that calculation, or when I did that calculation. Variable n comes out to be... 3.28, so 3.28. And if we're rounding that to um, a whole number, of course that needs to be rounded up to uh, four, okay? So the, the actual safety factor is gonna be slightly higher than 3.5 because we only needed 3.28 uh, boards for the uh, width of the beam. Uh, but we're going to use four. Okay, questions about that first part of the problem? That's that's mostly a review of, or not mostly, it's entirely a review of the, uh, the bending stress um, concepts. Um, let's go on to uh, part two um, then, which is the, uh, which is the new material. So we'll do this part over here. Okay, so is tau acceptably low? So what we want to do here is compare the allowable shear stress, which is the ultimate shear stress of the wood, um, to the maximum shear stress present within the beam. Okay, um, And the equation for transverse shear stress is VQ over I, and that's an I, I, T, okay? So for something that has a rectangular cross section and is experiencing a vertical shear force, um, we can plot a graph of how shear stress tau varies over the height position in the beam H. And uh, variable Q here is A prime Y bar prime. And A prime is the portion of the cross-sectional area above or below the location where you want the shear stress. Um, so for points at the bottom, 
of the cross section or at the top of the cross section. Variable Q is zero, so shear stress is zero at those locations. And then moving from the bottom, let's say upward through the cross section, as you move upward, the only variable in this equation here that's changing is Q. Um, I here needs to be, in this case, Ixx, the moment of inertia of the cross section about the centroidal axis that's perpendicular to the shear force. Okay, so this is Ixx down here. So that's not changing. Uh, T is the thickness of the beam and V is the internal shear force at your location of interest. So none of those things are changing, only Q is changing. So as you move upwards, Q uh, starts to increase and you get a parabolic um, curve like this that has uh, maximum shear stress at the location of the centroid. So we want to calculate for our problem the shear stress anywhere along that line. So all of these points along that line will experience the maximum shear stress tau max. Now when you want to calculate the shear stress at one of those points, again area A prime needs to be the area above or below the line that you're calculating the shear stress along. So take this area here as area A prime. And then Y bar prime, Y bar prime is the distance between the centroid of A prime and the centroid of the whole cross section here. So this is Y bar prime there. And variable T, variable T is the length of the line that you're calculating the shear stress along. So again, uh, if we use this area as A prime, we're finding the shear stress at any points along that line. So variable T is the length of the line that we're calculating the shear stress along. So it's that dimension there. So let's take um, our equation here and set those two things equal. So ultimate shear strength divided by the safety factor is VQ over IT. Okay. And in this case, if we want the maximum shear stress, this wants to be the maximum internal uh, shear force. And then Q's chosen so as to calculate the shear stress where it's maximum. So let's put all the, uh, all the different numbers in for, um, for the variables in this equation. So ultimate shear strength for, um, for Douglas Fir uh, from the material property table is let's see, 1.1 KSI. So we've got 1.1 times 10 to the three divided by, now in this case, the safety factor is what we're looking for, right? So in order to determine if tau is acceptably low, we wanna solve for what the safety factor in shear is. And if the safety factor is above 3.5, then yes, the shear stress is acceptably low. If the safety factor is below 3.5, then it's not acceptable. So safety factor, maximum shear force, doesn't matter whether you use uh, the maximum shear force positive or negative, you want to put it in as positive in this equation anyway. So three KSI, our variable Q now. So let's do A prime first. So A prime is going to be the base, which was two inches multiplied by four boards. So eight, so we've got two, inches, four boards, and then the whole uh, cross section was eight inches high, so the height of A prime is four inches. So four inches, so that is all A prime there. And then Y bar prime, if this distance here is four inches, Y bar prime is half of that two inches. So this is, that's a pretty ugly bracket. Y bar prime, there we go. Divided by I one twelfth 
base, which is two times four, eight. Height, the overall height of the cross section, eight. Cube that and multiply by the thickness T, which is eight. Okay. All right, so then uh, we solve for the safety factor. Okay. Uh, when I did that, what did I get when I did that? 15.6. Okay. So to answer the question, uh, is tau acceptably low? Um, well, 15.6 is greater than our required safety factor of 3.5, so therefore, uh, yes, the shear stress is acceptably low. Okay, um, I'll give you a second to digest that while I erase couple of things from this side of the board. There we go. Um, so any questions about uh, any of the uh, components that went into that equation there? Everything, uh, everything makes sense? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no questions, okay. <laughs> Sounds good, Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, let's uh, let's go ahead and do the second one. So that was just sort of you know, a basic problem to get us started and uh, and remind us of all the variables that are in that shear stress stress equation and what they what they refer to okay all right problem number two so we've got a beam in this question that looks like this where we have a linearly decreasing distributed load like that and then a linearly increasing distributed load that reaches about the same no not about it does reach the same magnitude at its highest point so this is 80 newtons per meter there and this over here is also 80 newtons per meter here Okay, a couple of support reactions, uh, BY and AY, and the distances here, this distance is six centimeters. This distance is 12 centimeters. Okay, and the cross section, of the beam looks like this. There we go. So it's sort of a box beam, but instead of these pieces being outside here, they're kind of shifted inwards a little bit. So it's between sort of a box beam and an I beam almost. Um, okay, some dimensions on this. Okay, need that there. Um, the overall width is 18, 18 millimeters. So this is a really small beam, 18 millimeters. Um, and actually, yeah, the lengths are small as well. Um, the overall height of the cross section is six millimeters. And the thickness here is one millimeter. And the thickness over here is one millimeter as well. And then the distance that these are set in from the edge 
is three millimeters. Okay. All right, so let's see. Um, the problem statement says, a small beam will be made by joining four one millimeter thick acrylic sheets using a specialized glue. Okay, so our sheets are one, two, three, four, all one millimeter thick, and then we're joining them using glue. So um, let's adjust how I did that. Um, so this joint here, uh, that's a glued joint, and the same for this here, and this here, and this here. So that's where the glue is between those areas. Okay, um, first part of the problem asks, what is the required shear strength of the glue for a safety factor of 1.2? So tau... Uh, so our required shear strength. So let's say, what's the required shear strength of the glue for a safety factor of 1.2 is the question. Okay, let's do the first part. The required shear strength for the glue for a safety factor of 1.2. Well, we know where the glue is, okay? So for the re required shear strength of the glue, what we want to find is the maximum shear stress at that location and then multiply it by our safety factor 1.2 and that will give us the required shear strength. In other words, we want to set up our equation so that we've got the required shear strength of the glue divided by our safety factor here and we're gonna set that equal to the maximum shear stress at the location of the glue. Okay. Um, if we want to find the shear stress at the location of the glue, then for our variable uh, Q in VQ over IT, where Q is A prime Y bar prime. What we need to use for A prime is an area um, above or below the location where we want the shear stress. So we want the shear stress at the location of the glue. So we'd want to use for our area A prime, the area above that, okay? Um, the other option here, would be to use the area below that location. So it would also be correct for A prime to take that area there. So we can use this area as A prime or we could use this area as A prime if we want the shear stress in the uh, glue. Both would give that to us. Now, when you're thinking about y bar prime, y bar prime is the distance between the centroid of A prime and the centroid of the entire cross section. So this is y bar prime. Uh, in this case, you know where the centroid of A prime is because you're just finding the centroid of a rectangle. In this case, the centroid of A prime is the centroid of a complex shape. Um, so you need to calculate where the centroid for A prime is, and that's, that's one extra step to go through. So we'll choose to do the easier of those two options, okay, and use this as A prime. So let's go ahead and, um, and look at the other variables that we're going to need. So we're going to set this up and say that tau glue divided by our safety factor is VQ over IT, recognizing that for A prime, we want that area. So we've sorted out what Q is. Um, for V, what we want here is the maximum internal shear force because that will give us the maximum shear stress that the glue uh, is subjected to. So let's pause. And before we go further with this equation, Let's go back here, figure out what our support reactions are, 
and then we'll draw our shear diagram. Okay. So let's do V in units of, not kip, we're not in US, V in units of newtons because that's what our loads are given at. Okay, there we go. And we'll take this and bring it on down. Okay, so support reactions, um, pretty straightforward here. Um, some of the moments about A to get BY. Now, I'm taking out the space where I'd normally draw the moment diagram because um, in order to do this problem, we just need where the maximum shear stress is. And that's for part one. And part two, by the way, asks, asks about shear stress too. So we're not gonna need the maximum moment. So I'm taking out the space that I normally reserve for that. So some of the moments about A, we've got, first of all, the contribution from this triangular distributed load. So that's the resultant multiplied by the distance the resultant is away from point A. So the resultant is one half, uh, the base 12, 0 0.12 meters uh, times the height, 80, one half base height, uh, multiplied by the distance the resultant will be away from point A. So that will be, of the total base of that triangle, the resultant will be one third of the distance from the larger end, so four, eight, 12, so uh, four here. Okay, and then we're adding on the same quantity for the other uh, triangular distributed load, so one half base, 0 0.06 height, and then multiplied by the distance, the resultant is away from point A. So that's going to be 12 plus 2, 4, so 12 plus 4, we've got 16 centimeters, 0.16. And then those two things summed together have to be counterbalanced by uh, the moment from BY. So that's going to be BY multiplied by what? 18, 0 0.18. Okay. BY comes out to be, when I did it, 3.2. And then some of the forces in the Y direction has to be zero, right? That would give you AY is equal to four newtons. Okay, so let's uh, draw our shear and our shear diagram now. I was going to say shear and moment, but we don't need the we don't need the moment diagram. So, starting from zero, we jump upwards by the magnitude of a y. So that's four. There we go, and then we have negative values of distributed load. Okay, uh, so we have to have a negative slope on the shear diagram. And those negative values become smaller and smaller negative values. So the negative slope becomes a smaller and smaller negative slope. So we've got a line that sort of uh, goes like this. Okay. And then the negative values of distributed load start increasing again. So higher and higher negative values. So the slopes has to start becoming more and more negative again. Right, so it needs to become steeper and steeper like that. And then we finally reach the end of the beam where we have to jump back up by B, Y, and end back up at zero. So we know that the point that we get to must be equal to the value of B, Y, which we said was 3.2. So minus 3.2 there. All right. Okay, so, uh, here we've got our maximum internal shear is four newtons. Good. So let's go ahead and let's uh, let's complete this equation here. So tau glue is what we're looking for. We're dividing by the safety factor that we have, 1.2. OK, 
Okay, V max, we've got four Newtons. Q, um, for A prime here, we're dealing with uh, A prime in this diagram here. Um, A prime is gonna be 18 millimeters multiplied by one millimeter. So 0 0.018, 0 0.001, putting those into meters. So this quantity here is A prime. And then Y bar prime next gets multiplied in by A prime. Uh, y bar prime would be what the distance to the centroid A prime from the bottom, which is what six to the top minus a half. So we've got five and a half there subtract the distance from the bottom to the centroid of the overall cross section, which is three. So five and a half minus three, two and a half millimeters, two, five, and this is Y bar prime there. And divide that all by I. Now for, um, for our calculation of I here, and we'll just make use of uh, this space here. Should have just erased the whole thing and started the game. Didn't really save any time trying to uh, erase parts of that. Okay, so for our calculation of I, the thing to realize is that this is much like an I beam or a box beam where we can take I for the whole outside. Okay, so I for outside and then just subtract off I for these three different gap regions. Okay, um, so we can do that because the centroid for I of the outside lies right in the middle, and then the centroid for this gap region lies at the same spot, and the centroid for this gap is there, and the centroid for this gap is there, and they all lie on that same horizontal centroidal axis. So we can simply uh, do um, I is equal to the summation of the I value, simple superposition here, um, I for the outside minus I for the gap regions, okay? So let's do that down here. So we've got I for the whole outside, 1 12th overall base of 18 millimeters, uh, height six millimeters, cube that, and then subtract I for the gap region and what we're going to do is instead of doing three separate gap regions and all add them all together, we're going to uh, pretend we're rearranging um, some of the components of the beam and instead look at it as if we took these two pieces and move them all the way over to the side so we just have one combined gap region. No difference between this and this in terms of its moment of inertia about its horizontal centroidal axis. So the combined base for this, the three gap regions combined would be 18 minus one minus one, 16 millimeters. And the height of that gap region, six minus one minus one, four, point zero zero four. cube that, close our bracket there and multiply next by variable T. Now, remember we're finding shear stress at the location of the glue. So that's here and here. Um, T needs to be the length of the line that you're calculating the shear stress along, right? So in this case, by taking this as A prime, we're calculating what the shear stress is at any point along that line and any point along that line. So T needs to be the combined lengths of those two lines. So a millimeter here and a millimeter there, two millimeters total. So 0 0.002.
All right, so out of this comes the sheer strength of the glue. The required sheer strength of the glue. Uh, when I did that, I got 453 kilopascals. 453 kilopascals. There we go. Excellent. Uh, questions about any of the numbers that went into this equation here? We'll, uh, we'll clean up some space for the next part of the problem here. Remembering that our maximum internal shear force was four newtons. Okay, so for part two of the problem, let's see what part two was. Part two, determine the maximum shear stress in the acrylic sheet. Okay, so tau max in... What is the maximum shear stress in the acrylic sheet itself? Okay, um, again, uh, tau equals VQ over IT. Right, so if you want tau max, it's pretty obvious that V wants to be uh, V max. Um, I doesn't change. I is exactly the same as we did over here. Moment of inertia of the cross section about its horizontal centroidal axis. Um, and uh, what we really need to pick is what we are going to use as our area A prime in order for our shear stress tau to be the maximum shear stress. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, so like I said, this, this beam here that we're dealing with is really no different than either an I-beam where these two pieces are moved into the center or a box beam where they're moved to the outside. So if we think of it being like a box beam, Right, we can do a similar plot of how shear stress varies over the height of the cross section, right? We've got height position in the cross section H there and shear stress uh, tau there. And at the top and the bottom of this cross section, the shear stress is going to be zero because Q is zero at those locations. Um, so going from the bottom upwards, as we move from the bottom of the cross section upwards into the acrylic sheet, the level of shear stress is gonna start increasing because Q is gonna start increasing. So we'll start getting that curved line just as if we were moving um, through um, a solid rectangular cross section uh, like we did previously. And we're having the parabolic uh, shaped distribution of shear stress over that cross section. So we're gonna start increasing this like that initially. Once we get to the spot where we transition from um, a location where our thickness, T, is quite a large thickness up to a location where the thickness is the combined thickness of these two, uh, these two sides of the sheets, um, then T drops dramatically. So that's going to result in a sharp increase in tau. And then once we're in these sides here, then we're just gonna do increase as normal um, so that the maximum shear stress is going to be located at the centroid for the overall cross section. And then we'd have the mirror image on the other side here. So we'd have a distribution of shear stress over the cross section that sort of looks like this, where our maximum shear stress is 
right at the location of the centroid. So again, no difference between this picture that I've just drawn and if we erased these side pieces here and just moved them inwards a little bit like this. Distribution looks exactly the same because we're still moving from a region where T is large to a region where T is much smaller. Okay. So um, what we want to take then for area A prime in order to get tau max, we want the shear stress along at some location along either of those lines, all locations along those two lines that I've drawn there will have the same shear stress, which is the maximum shear stress. So area A prime needs to be the portion of the cross section above or below those lines. So here we go. So here's A prime. And then Y bar prime needs to be the distance between the centroid for A prime and the overall centroid for the cross section. So this is Y bar prime there. Okay, so let's talk about um, calculating Y bar prime uh, for a second. Um, so let's just redraw this shape that we have. Okay, there we go. That's our area A prime here. And Y bar prime, looks like it should be a little bit lower. Y bar prime is the distance between um, the centroid of the overall cross section, which is here, and the centroid of A prime, which is somewhere uh, there. Right, so this is Y bar prime. This is just like finding the centroid location of a channel section, right? Um, no difference. So in order to find Y bar prime, right, we would use the equation uh, sum of A Y bar over sum of the areas A where we're breaking this shape up into three locations with known uh, centroids. So uh, centroid for this piece there, centroid for this piece at the same location, and centroid for the top piece there. Okay. So this really becomes, if we call this uh, shape shape one, and this shape shape one, and this shape uh, up here shape two, and then this becomes y bar one prime, and this distance is y bar two prime. Okay, then here we've got uh, two times a one multiplied by y bar one prime plus a two y bar two prime over a one plus a two. Now, um, the smart thing to do here, or a thing to recognize, is that we're going to take this value of y bar prime and we're going to end up putting it in here and multiplying it by a prime to get q. So when we calculate q and take this quantity here and multiply it by a prime, let's see what's going to happen. Uh, this should be 2 times a1. 2 times a1 plus a2, that is equal to a prime, right? That is a prime. So this cancels out with this, and then we're left with q as just being the numerator here, which is uh, 2a1 y bar 1 prime plus a2 y bar 2 prime, right? And this quantity, a1 y bar 1 prime, that's just equal to what q is for shape 1. So this is really 2 times the q value for shape 1 plus the q value for shape 2. So in other words, if you want q for a more complex shape, you can get that by just summing the q values for the individual component shapes. Okay. 
So that is, um, that's what we'll do for calculating uh, the Q value for this A prime that we've identified here. So let's go ahead and um, do the calculation that we need to do now. We've talked about all the components that go into this. Okay, I'm going to start it off here so I've got lots of horizontal real estate on the board. So we're going to say that tau max is equal to uh, the maximum internal shear force was 4 newtons. Okay, and then we're going to calculate the Q as the summation of the individual uh, Q values, 2Q1 plus 2Q. So for two multiplied by Q1, A prime here for this area, shape one, is going to be what? Um, this is six, so that means that each of these are four millimeters, which means that this is two millimeters. So we've got two millimeters multiplied by one millimeter. 0 0.002 multiplied by 0 0.001. Okay, so this is a one prime, right? or a one, I guess we were just calling it. A one, um, y bar one prime here. If this is two millimeters, then the distance to the centroid is one millimeter. So 0 0.001 y bar one prime plus the Q value for shape number two. So its area is 18 millimeters multiplied by one, 0 0.018, 0 0.001 is a two. And then uh, y bar two prime, so we've got the total height of half of the cross section is three millimeters and then we're moving down by a half millimeter so 2.5 so this is y bar 2 prime all right um so we've got our V and now we've got our Q. Let's close off the bracket on the other side for that and divide it all by our I value. That's I for the entire cross section. So this is going to be 1 12th. Uh, we'll do outside minus gap regions gain 1 12th base 18 height 6. Okay, cube that minus the gap regions, 1 12th base, uh, 18 minus 2, 16, height 4, cube that, close our bracket, multiply by variable t. Again, we're calculating the shear stress at this location and at that location, so, or the shear stress at any point along those two lines, so our thickness T needs to be the combined length of those two lines, so two millimeters again, 0 0.002. All right, good stuff. Got all the numbers in that. Um, plug them all in, uh, and you get 411 kilopascals for the maximum shear stress. Okay, um, I'll give you a second to digest that while I get a drink of water. And then uh, we'll move on to the third and final problem. Okay, any questions for where numbers went or came from in, uh, in this equation?
right. Let's go ahead then and do the final of the three problems. Okay. Problem number three. Okay, so here we've got a beam that's supported by two cables. One cable connecting there and another cable connecting there. This one's going up in a direction like that. And that one's going up in a direction like that. Chuk, 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 chuk. Uh, what's that angle 55 degrees and the same here 55 degrees all right and there's three loads acting downwards so we've got 900 pounds there and then over here another 900 pounds and then over here the same thing 900 pounds all right, uh, distances. This distance here is going to be six feet. That distance is the same, same, and same. So symmetrical again about the uh, vertical axis here. Okay, um, the beams cross section looks like this. So it's a wooden box beam and it is joined or held together, the four different pieces of wood, the four boards with screws that go like this. Okay, maybe we'll draw the longitudinal view of this. Of course, we'd get a couple of lines here and a line there. Um, and then there's a row of screws running down the length of the beam on the top and the bottom on each side like that. So let's put on some dimensions here. So this board is going to have a height of six inches, which is the overall beam height. And it's got a width of or thickness of one inch. And then the other two boards that this is made out of have a width of four inches and a thickness of, again, uh, one inch. There. All right, let's see what the problem statement actually says. A wooden box beam will be loaded as shown. If the screws used to connect this beam are placed every four inches along its length, So this is four inches. Determine the required shear capacity of the screws to the nearest 25 pounds using a safety factor of uh, 3.5. So we want to find the required shear capacity of the screws for a safety factor of 3.5 and we want to round to nearest 25 pound mark. Okay. Uh, obviously here when we get a value for what the required shear capacity of the screws needs to be we're going to want to round that up uh, because we don't want to make the screws uh, less strong than they need to be. They need to be at least uh, exactly as strong as they need to be or uh, rounded up to the nearest 25. Okay, so this is a um, this is a fastener problem. So our equation for shear stress tau equals uh, VQ over IT. We saw in the lecture that we can do a slight modification of this equation to get something that will analyze the shear force 
that each fastener in a beam needs to resist. Um, so that equation looks like this, where we have VF, the actual shear capacity in units of force that each fastener needs to be able to resist, uh, multiplied by the number, that's a pound sign, number sign, number of, um, fast, number of rows of fasteners holding on whatever area we choose as area A prime, we'll talk about that. Uh, divided by the safety factor multiplied by the longitudinal spacing D of the fasteners. So this is D equals four inches there. And then on the other side, this equals VQ over I. Okay, T has disappeared because we've multiplied that in by tau in the derivation of this equation to get uh, VF in units of force here. Okay, um, so uh, if we want the required shear capacity of the screws, we want to know, um, we want to analyze what the maximum shear force these screws are going to need to resist is. So we're going to want to use the maximum internal shear force in this uh, equation. And then it's just a case of figuring out what we're going to use for area A prime when we calculate Q. So um, when you're choosing area A prime here for questions involving fasteners, what you want to do is choose one single area of the cross section, so one single continuous area, and an area that is A only held on by fasteners to the rest of the cross section, and B, doesn't have a centroid that lies at the location of the cross section's overall centroid. Okay, so um, let's look at the two different options that you'd have for choosing A prime for uh, this beam here. Okay, and one's the uh, correct option to choose and one is the incorrect one. So um, if you chose this area here as area A prime, that's an area of the cross section that's only held on by fasteners, okay? But the problem is that its centroid lies at the same position as the overall centroid of the cross section, which means that if you try and apply this equation, y bar prime is gonna be zero and then you don't have something you can solve. Um, so the correct choice for A prime would be uh, this area here. That's an area that's only held on by uh, fasteners and its centroid is not located at the overall location of the centroid, it's spaced. Um, so you actually do have a value of y bar prime that you can calculate. The, um, the part of that statement where you want an area of the cross section that's only held on by fasteners, right? What you, what you wouldn't want to do is take an area A prime that's like this, right? Because that area that I've hatched there, that's not only held on by fasteners because sure, the center of it's only held in by fasteners, the screws coming from the sides inwards, but there's a wood to wood connection within that over those two locations. So if you use this as area A prime, you're not actually determining anything about the fasteners, you're actually determining um, something to do with the shear stress in the wood at this location. Okay. So the correct thing to do is choose this area here as area A prime. So now that we've now that we've sort of uh, had that intellectual um, part of the problem figured out, then the only thing that's really left to do is figure out what the maximum shear force is. And we'll get that by drawing our shear diagram here. So we'll do our shear diagram in units of pounds. Uh, let's mark off a couple of locations here. Okay, 
And again, let's take these cables out and we'll just replace them by the actual uh, support reactions present. Change this to a free body diagram instead. Okay, um, both of those are gonna have a vertical component. Let's call this AY, BY, and then a horizontal component, AX, BX. And of course we know that AX is equal to BX because those cables were at both the same, same angles and no other forces uh, in the horizontal direction present. Similarly, because the beam is symmetric about the uh, central vertical axis, um, AY and BY are going to be the same. So we can quickly figure out what they are by summing the total downward load and dividing by two. So we've got 9, 18, 27, um, which 13 and a half, 1350 pounds each. 1350 pounds each. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and draw our shear diagram then. And I'm not even going to figure out what AX and BX are in this case because AX and B. AX and BX would cause um, a tensile normal stress to develop in the portion of the beam that's between these because if you did a section cut anywhere between uh, AX and BX you'd have an internal normal force equal to those forces there and it would be a tensile internal normal force. But what we're interested in is maximum shear force and um, those horizontal support reactions AX and BX will not influence our shear diagram, so I'm not going to bother figuring out what they are. So we start at zero here. Um, the first portion of the beam here, there's no distributed load, so zero uh, distributed load, zero slope. Jump down by 900, so we're at minus, jump down a little bit further than that, and here we go, minus 900 here. Uh, again, no distributed load, no slope. Jump upwards by 1350, uh, so that's taking us up to positive 450 from minus 900. No distributed load, zero slope. Downward load of 900 pounds, so now we're jumping downwards. Okay, uh, 900, 450, that's minus 450. Zero distributed load, slope of zero. And then up by 1350. Okay, that gives us what? 1350, 900. Plus 900. Of course, it's plus, we're on the positive side, 900. Um, zero distributed load, slope of zero, and then down by 900. Okay, that's good. We get back to zero. Mental math checks out. Um, so, shade, patch some of this in so we can see which portions are above horizontal axis and which are below. Okay, so um, two maximum shear forces, both uh, 900, right? One that's negative here, one that's positive there. Um, we just want to use the largest absolute value for Vmax there, so it doesn't matter uh, whether we're using locations here or locations over there. So let's take everything we've got and put it all together and complete the problem here. So Vf, that's what we want to find. Uh, number. This is the number of rows of fasteners that are connecting A prime into the rest of the cross section. So we've got one row of fasteners that is along the left hand side and another row of fasteners, another row of screws that's along the right hand side. There's two rows of screws holding in A prime, so this needs to be a two there. Safety factor is what, 3.5 multiplied by the longitudinal spacing. D is four inches equals V max, V max, V max, V max. 900 pounds. Q, A prime, Y bar prime. A prime is what? Four inches multiplied by one inch. 
4 by 1. And this is a prime y bar prime, the distance between the centroid of a prime and the centroid of the overall cross section. Uh, total height of 6, so this means this height here is 3 inches, uh, 2 for inches. There we go. That's a bit big. There we go. 3 inches. And then we're subtracting half an inch uh, there because that thickness here is one inch. So we've got two and a half for y bar prime divided by vq over i. So again, for the box beam, we are going to do the whole outside. That's 1 12th. The base is four, five, six. Height is also six, cube that, and then subtract off the gap region on the inside. So 1 12th, uh, base is four inches, and height is six, minus one, minus one, uh, also four, cube that. Okay. Again, we can do the simple superposition because the centroid of the Whole outside lies in the middle. Centroid of the gap region lies at the same location, both on the same horizontal axis. So this is giving us the required shear capacity that each of these screws would need to have. Okay. All right. Um, so let's see what that gave me when I did it. I got. 726.9 pounds. 726.9 pounds. All right, rounding to the nearest 25. That, well, 725 is a lot closer than 750. But again, if we round down to 725, then our safety factor is no longer 3.5. So it's not as safe as it needs to be. So we need to round this up to 700 and. 50 pounds. There we go. Okay, um, questions about uh, any of the numbers that went in there or choice of areas?